name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The tenth day of September, we celebrate the memory of the holy martyrs Minodora, Metrodora, and Nymphodora. We also celebrate the memory of the holy apostles Apelas, Lucias, and, and Clement, and the most pious Empress Pukiria, who died in peace. Also, the Venerable Paul, the Obedient, the Robert Kiev Caves, and the Venerable Yosef of Ruben. We're going to talk quickly about the ancient martyrs who hold the first place in the rank of the day, uh, but because we've talked about it before and, and, and their life is quite short, we're also going to talk about the Empress Pukiria. And there's several icons here that we, we're going to be able to show you of the Empress and uh, quite an impressive life uh, uh, and interesting historically. Let's go to the Virgin Martyrs and just talk about them fairly quickly. They lived in the early 4th century during the reign of Galerius Maximian. Maximi this is page dedicated him on Wikipedia, this old statue dedicated him. He was a persecutor of Christians, one of the most fiercest of the day, toward the end of the pagan rule and the persecution of Christians in the Roman Empire. So we're in the beginning of the fourth century. So when you're thinking about the history of the church, everybody look to me, please. When you think about the history of the church, you think there's not one to twenty. Most of you can count from one to twenty. So if you think about that, whenever I say fourth century, eighth century, that's right, you're just going to think, well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, tens in the middle, twenties at the end. So the fourth century now, we're in one, two, three, four, three hundred down here. Not, not too uh, long before the first ecumenical council, George. How you doing, Smith? Doing good, good, George. Good. And not before, not long before the reign of Emperor Constantine the Great. That's where we are in our timeline. Here we are in our images of the of the of the martyrs. We see them there. And let's talk quickly about their life. They had a great love for Christ, so much so that they decided to leave the company of people, they leave the society of people and go into the mountains. And they lived there far from mankind, in every worldly care. You're going to see that a lot. Uh, Michael, you're going to see that a lot in the lives of the saints. They want to go away from the passions and the atonement of life. They want to be alone with God. They want to pray because that's how it was. Actually, that's what God intended in the garden of, uh, in the garden before the fall. Adam and Eve were in the midst of God's wonderful creation, communion with God in peace and quiet, and uh, and loving God. And this is what many of the saints desire. They leave and they go far from company of men and women in order to be totally devoted to God. And this is what our saints did. So much so that they make progress that many people started to come and seek their uh, their guidance. And, uh, and and not long after, the local ruler, the emperor, emperor's uh, uh, representative, Frondo, the governor of the region, sent soldiers to force them to deny Christ. You see how the devil works. Listen to, listen to this, how the devil works, Elias. He's always looking to force us, pressure us, push us, and deny our free will, whereas God is always looking to incre increase our ability to have freedom from all the passions and all the limitations. It's just the opposite. The devil's always trying to pressure us into doing his will. Go ahead. What'd you ask? Increase. Increase. To, to make more. To make more. Okay. And so... The Lord wants us to be totally free of all the passions and even death itself. So the, our, our virgin martyrs were tortured, and um, the uh, uh, Menaldora, which was probably the oldest, doesn't say, but I think it's the oldest, she was first to be tortured and martyred, and he thought he would make the others fearful to deny Christ. And they say, good looking. They thought he would deny Christ that way, and so uh, he brought the other two in. They were all the more encouraged to give their life for Christ. They were martyred, and their relics, in spite of him attempting to hide them and burn them, God's providence preserved them, and they were taken by the, by the saints. And this is the life that we have written down for these 
uh, virgin martyrs. Let's go now to our second saint today, and that is Pulchidia. Let's talk about where, when she lived. Well, about 100 years later, all the world had come upside down in 100 years, from the time of the persecutions before Constantine to the time of the childhood of our saint Pulchidia, the empress, the whole world changed. And now in the, in the reign of her brother, Theodosius, that she was, she was responsible for him for many years and helped him in his reign, they made the, they, they essentially um, drove out the pagan elements in the empire. They drove out the pagan, uh, uh, those who remained stubborn in paganism in terms of ruling in the, in the empire. And over her long uh, time as, as empress, and her brother's long reign of almost 50 years, the whole empire became very much devoted and, and, and serving the Christian church and uh, the uh, salvation of the, of the servants of God in the empire. So we're in the fourth, early 400s now, not much longer after than what uh, our previous saints. Um, I neglected to say, by the way, this is the Roman Empire, uh, not uh, in, the, in the fourth century, our, our virgin martyrs lived in this, not far from where our empress. Our empress also lived right here in Constantinople. So you remember our em the empire here. We have modern day Greece. We have Europe, Africa, right, Middle East, and here is Bithynia, part of the uh, Roman Empire, and that's where both the saints and Pulchidia would um, would live. Here is an ancient uh, sculpture or. Uh, Miniature uh, carving uh, showing the Empress. It was so influential. Here's an icon of our saint today. Let's go to our, her life and, and, and talk about her life with you all. It's such a beautiful, wonderful witness to God. Some of you can read that. You can see that she was born in 399, right at the end of the fourth century, to the daughter of the Emperor Arcadius and his wife Evlukia, very important. Uh, in their own right. Her brother was Emperor Theodosius II, and when her father died, she became, uh, she was the regent. In other words, what's the regent? It's the person who helps reign and, and, and rule the empire when a emperor is young. He was just a small boy when he became emperor. He was seven years old. Who's seven years old here today? Can somebody show me who said seven years old? Well, guess what? How would, it, how would it be to be the emperor of the whole whole Mediterranean, whole world at that time? That's how it was for Theodosius. What, what a responsibility. Well, she was a bit older, and so she became the regent. She was a devout, devout Christian. She took a vow of virginity to avoid being forced into marriage from a young, young age. And she convinced her sisters to do the same. We have, um, uh, we have an image of the sisters. Well, here's an image of the saints. But, no. Her sisters were also uh, de devoted, de devote, devoted to virginity, although they did not enter a monastery. She remained in the palace all her life, but the palace was made into a monastery. What a wonderful example. You, whether you go to the monastery or you don't go to the monastery, it doesn't matter. You need to live ascetically. That's the one life in Christ. Everyone is called to fast and to pray. And to, and, to, and to devote themselves to works of charity and to defending the faith. And this is what our empress did. So she was involved extensively in the education of her brother, even though she was only two years older than him. And listen to this. At the age of 13, she was only 13, she dismissed her brother's tutor and said, I will assume the education of my brother. And she taught her brother how to dress, how to sit, how to walk, how to withhold his laughter. Did you hear that one? How to withhold his laughter. How to withhold his laughter. Not to laugh. Here we have in our day and age this crazy thing that we all have to laugh all day. And laughter is just good. It's just it's seen as, a, as an absolute good. Guess what? It's not all that good. Because when we're laughing all the time, it becomes excessive. And it becomes it become jokes uh, that make fun of other people. It's awful. It's not good. First of all, we're not thinking of God. We're not honoring God. We're not honoring our brothers and sisters usually. And our minds are taken away from the contemplation of God. And it's not, it's not something that's modest to all go, go around about laughing all day. And so she taught her brother to withhold his laughter, how to be revered as an emperor. She trained him and brought him up 
uh, preparing him for his rule uh, and, uh, of, the, of the empire. He, she also taught him to pray always and the church and attend church services regularly. Again, I, she made her the palace into a little monastery, and she and she helped her brother live this life. She was so educated in Greek and Latin, Basil, come back. Uh, she was so educated in Greek and Latin that she was able to speak and write with both in, in, with complete confidence. With complete confidence, she could write in either Greek or Latin. And it was probably her influence that changed the official uh, language of the empire from Latin to Greek in her day. So the whole court, which is usually a place of debauchery during the pagan times, with debauchery means that they were not modest, they were not chaste, they were not pure. Well, now it became a pious, at, an austere atmosphere. A monastic lifestyle. Here's what the ecclesiastical historian says in his day, who wrote in, in her lifetime, at the end of her life, he writes the history of, uh, uh, of the last couple hundred years, and here's what he says about her. They all pursue the same mode of life, her sisters and hers. They are sedulous, they are zealous in the attendance in the house of prayer. They go to church all the time. They have great charity towards strangers and the poor. They pass their days and their nights together in singing the praises of God. What a wonderful image. What a wonderful image. What a blessed life. Within the palace, they chant and they recite passages of sacred scripture and they're fasting twice per week, Wednesdays and Fridays. They renounced luxurious jewelry. You know, to be an empress of the Roman Empire at that height of the, uh, at the height of the empire, and uh, you could have whatever you wanted. Gold, silver, jewelry, whatever you wanted, you could have, but they renounced it. That is an ascetic feat in itself. They didn't want any part of it. They wore simple clothing. They had, of course, their vow of virginity. They were devoted to this virginity to God and instructed, uh, she instructed her sisters to do likewise. They avoided the cause of scandal and opportunities for intrigue. And listen to this. She permitted no man to enter her palace. No man to enter her palace. Because she wanted not even the scandal, not even the appearance that she had renounced her virginity and that she had taken uh, a, a, a man. So this is the life uh, of a young lady at that time, the Empress Bukidia. Now, in 414, the Senate, the, the House of, of Representatives, so to speak, or the, the people uh, who represented, who were uh, in the uh, government there, they proclaimed her empress. They made her regent for her brother at the age of 15. And when Theodosius became capable of ruling himself in 416, she continued to have great influence on her brother. She removed, as I said earlier, uh, and, and influenced him to remove all the pagans from civil service. Under her influence, Theodosius and his wife, Evdokia, who had been a pagan, became devout Christians. She used her wealth for the church. And she also was a great defender of orthodoxy. She, she encouraged Theodosius, who initially was, was swayed by the heretic Nestorius, who was the patriarch of Constantinople. She persuaded him to fight against Nestorius. She was very pious. She understood that the teaching of Nestorius was heresy. She supported St. Cyril. Later on, 30, 20 years later, uh, in uh, during the time when there was another heresy, the Monophysite heresy, uh, she, although she was no longer the close confidant of the Theodosius, her brother, uh, she was approached by the Pope of Rome and others to support orthodoxy against the heretical robber Sidon. And then when Theodosius suddenly died in 450, she was uh, made, she became the empress. She married Marcion, but she never renounced her vow of virginity to live as brothers and sisters. Brother and sister. She was married in 450. And she was largely responsible for and sat with Marcion at the Fourth Ecumenical Council condemning the heresy. So here is not only a great model of virtue, not only an ascetic in the midst of the world and, and luxury, not only uh, a great uh, a woman of charity and love and, 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 and almsgiving, 
She added to that the great jewel of virtue, which is the defense of the Orthodox faith and the confession of it, and so important and decisive in her day for the sake of Orthodoxy. She reposed not long after this council. It was as if God had sent her right up into the council, then in age, at age 54, about, 55, she reposed, and she's remembered not only for her zeal, as I said, of orthodoxy, but listen to this. Listen to some of the things she did during her reign. She brought the relics of St. John Chrysostom back. They had been sent, St. John had been sent into exile, and his relics were far. She brought them back out of great love for the saint. She found the relics of the great 40 martyrs of Sebastian, great saints of the church. She found those relics. She built three churches, some of the most important churches in Constantinople. She built the monastery of the Panagia or the Gitria, the church of the Theotokos of Lachirne, a very important church that had a, an ama amazing history and to this day exists. And also the church of the Panagia Hakopratia. And she is also considered the founder of Estigmeno Monastery in Manapolis, or at least the beginning of that monastery. She's also commemorated at Sinopotamo Monastery as one of the founders. And she built many hospitals, houses for pilgrims. She gave her wealth to charity, and there was a whole district named after her in Constantinople because she built so many things during her reign and during her time in, as empress. She's considered and equal to the apostles. That's how great this was. So, one of the things we can take away for all of us in this day of feminism, when we want to always promote women because we feel that they've been treated unjustly in the past, and that's partly true, but we have this uh, image of the woman today, which is quite distorted. Well, here is a woman that was pious, faithful, chaste, a virgin, filled with virtues, a confessor of the faith, and in, in, in large measure, uh, very influential in the whole ruling of a whole empire. So this is a great example for all of our young ladies today. Yes, Mary. Uh, Maria. Well, where was she born and what was her name? Pukiria. Pukiria was the name. I don't know how, that's how we say it in Greek, correct? So, not sure. Uh, she was born in Constantinople. She was born in, as, a, as a daughter of an emperor. Any other questions? What can we take away from this? Let's hear what you have to say, quickly. Go ahead, Maria. Mm -hmm. Yes, so piety for the saints, love for the saints. So we can imitate her in the following ways. We can imitate her. Do we have love for the relics of the saints? Do we venerate them? Do we venerate the saints' memory? Do we uh, look to our brothers and sisters and, and try to give... Uh, to them when they have need. Do we, are we interested in the faith and what the faith is? You know, those heresies were not easy to spot for someone who didn't know theology. So how would an emperor or an empress know, well, who should I be with? Now, I've got this monk who's a theologian and this bishop who's a theologian are coming to me and trying to convince me that they have it right. And it's a very philosophical, theological question. So if she doesn't have a life that inspires her and the Spirit of God dwells in her, uh, and it's not going to be an easy thing to, to spot uh, heresy. You have to have that life. And there were many who fell away. So, so her defense of orthodoxy meant she had a very strict spiritual life, and that's, that's, that's the case. So God, may God, to the prayers of the Empress Bukiria, equal to the apostles, and the tender of orthodoxy, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. 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 Amen.